request. Stephanie and Dan will position Canada Arm 2 for EVA operations so that the tip of the arm is near the airlock and you can see the arm in position in the lower left. Scott will come out of the hatch first followed by wheels and you can see the handrails flashing around the, around the hatch. The first task on the EVA is to release the S-band antenna from Z1 transfer to the shuttle payload bay. They perform a leapfrog technique where wheels holds it then Scott holds it while Wheels moves to get into the arm, and then Scott hands it back off to Wheels. Here, Scott's high on the airlock, and Wheels is in the lower left receiving the antenna. This is video of Wheels holding the antenna so you can get a sense of scale. It weighs about 228 pounds. Wheels then begins a long ride down to the shuttle payload bay, uh, riding Canada Arm 2, while Scott translates down to the payload bay free float to meet him. Scott will arrive first, and he'll begin prep work for later tasks in the payload bay. But he'll drop what he's doing when Wheels gets there so they can together install the antenna on the carrier that you see flashing in the payload bay. Wheels will be directing the arm driver, Stephanie and Dan, to position him close to Scott and the carrier. Here you see Scott on the left side of the picture and Wheels in the middle. They both carefully install the antenna, assisting each other as required, and then fasten six bolts to hold it for landing. You're about to see a video of Wheels installing one of the bolts here. He works pretty low in the shuttle payload bay while Scott stays higher up near the sill. Now both of them are free float and they begin working on the power and data grapple fixture on the port side of the payload bay. They release four fasteners and then they both carry it over to No 2 Harmony, which is still in the bay. This grapple fixture couldn't be launched in place, so the EV crew will tie it down with tethers onto No 2 and it will take a ride over to the space station after EVA 1 when Canada Arm grapples a different fixture and moves Harmony over. And here you can see its temporary tie-down location for that ride. It's held in place by adjustable EVA tethers. There's more prep work to ready Harmony in the aft part of the payload bay. Previously, Scott had released two connectors that would be difficult to reach later. And now they'll be removing eight hard contamination covers from the ring on the berthing surface on the left. They'll also be removing six caps from under that large strip of insulation that's uh, flashing on the right. The last thing they'll do in the payload bay is remove the launched activation cable that's connecting node two to the shuttle payload bay. Up until it's disconnected, Harmony is receiving power to keep its heaters activated, but it must be disconnected for its move over to space station. When the cable's removed, Scott takes it back to the airlock with him. When the EV crew are clear, no two can be grappled and unberthed for its ride to ISS. Both crew members head to the airlock for some logistics, and then they split up somewhat. Scott goes up to the interface between the Z1 and P6 truss elements to disconnect four fluid lines, and that's where the video is flying right now. This is the first step in preparing P6 for removal from Z1. So here's the work site covered by a shroud. Scott has to tempor temporarily remove that shroud, and then he disconnects the ammonia-filled fluid umbilicals from P6 and mates them to Z1. He'll need to be in a foot restraint for many of the operations so he can work with the stiff fluid lines. Here you can see him demating and mating the lines in the neutral buoyancy laboratory. I'll point out, though, in the water, the lines are made of a plastic tubing and aren't nearly as stiff as the real lines. Here he's moving a connector to Z1. At the end of the procedure, he'll be replacing the shroud he previously removed on the Z1 side of the inner. <coughs> Meanwhile, Wheels has been busy getting a shroud ready to cover up the aft radiator on P6. This shroud starts off in a small bundle on the nader end, and there are long straps that Wheels deploys from the nader side to the zenith side of the radiator that are used as guides for the shroud. And you can see him here with the strap. When Scott gets there, they each take a side of the shroud and pull it up to cover up the radiator. Then they take two smaller shrouds up to the top of the P6 truss and install them on two boxes called the sequential shunt units. These boxes would get too cold while P6 is being relocated, so the crew installs shrouds on them to keep them warm. Later, after P6 is relocated and reactivated out on the end of the truss, the crew will need to remove them so the boxes don't get too hot. Here they're installing the, the starboard shroud first, followed by the port shroud. Mm -hmm. 
On the way into the airlock, Scott cleans up the antenna worksite by mating a connector, and then they ingress, wheels going in first. So at the end of the EVA, the S-band antenna is in the payload bay. Harmony is in transit on its way up to the port side of node one, and about half the preparations for P6 relocation are complete. After EVA-1, the crew is working on installing Node-2 onto Node-1, getting the suits and tools ready for EVA-2, and getting the space station robotic arm in position for P-6 relocation. The second spacewalk is performed on Flight Day 6 by Scott and Dan, and it's expected to be a six and a half hour EVA. So let's roll the video for that second EVA. On this EVA, Dan egresses the airlock and the second. The first main objective is to detach P6 from Z1, so the arm grapples P6, and Scott and Dan begin demating cables right after getting out of the hatch. There are nine cables, which answers the earlier question, that need to be demated in order for P6 to separate from Z1. Dan generally stays high, and you can see him up in the upper part here, and Scott stays low. They're actually swapping cables for caps that have been stowed on Z1. Some of the cables might be a little stiff, but for most of them, the major task is really getting them tucked close to structure at the end of the procedure. After that, Scott closes a capture latch to hold P6 on a Z1 while they go around the P6-Z1 interface, disconnecting grounding strap bolts and demating the four main bolts that have been holding P6 on a Z1 since it was first installed. These are called RTAS bolts. RTAS stands for Rocketdyne Truss Attachment System. And we're planning to use a ratchet wrench with a handle extension to break the torque on these main bolts. After the last bolt's removed, Scott opens the capture claw, and Stephanie and Wheels move P6 up away from Z1 using Canada Arm 2 for its first move in the relocation process. After this, the EV crew members separate, and Dan goes up onto the truss to perform three short but important tasks. First, he goes to the starboard S1 truss element, here he'll be reconfiguring some connectors for a squib firing unit. Uh, the connectors are located between the S1 radiator beam here in the foreground and the S1 truss, which as we rotate around will be on this left. After performing this connector swap, the S1 outboard radiators can later be deployed using ground commands. Then Dan heads to the S0 truss and he actually enters into the truss. In the truss there are electrical lines that need to be rerouted so P6 can be activated when it's out on P6. You can see the flashing connectors in the zenith and nadir parts of this bay. Although it's a tight squeeze, we've sent crew members into this bay previously per to perform similar reconfigurations. And Dan just needs to use caution not to bump into lines and connectors while he's inside the truss. Then he'll egress the truss and begin heading off to his third task in this string of EVA tasks. That task is the change out of a critical power control box. This box needs to be exchanged with a new box before the station robotic arm can use a grapple fixture on no two harmony as its base. Meanwhile, Scott went over to node two, which is newly installed onto the port uh, side of node one. Node two needs to be externally outfitted and readied for future spacewalks and berthing operations on its ports. At the end of the EVA, Dan comes over and helps with this outfitting as well. The newly installed items are 11 handrails, two straps called gap spanners, three worksite interfaces or WIFs, an electrical connector, and five small trunnion and keel pin covers. They brought these items over in bags that they prepped inside, pulling them out two or three items at a time to save trips. Scott will also remove four pins, one from each of the radial berthing mechanisms, and he'll release the zenith most berthing pedal launch restraints. They'll also remove 16 caps from under the large MLI covers that you see flashing on the right. When Dan gets done on the truss, uh, Scott will stop work temporarily on this outfitting, and then he and Dan will detach the grapple fixture that they'd installed on Harmony for its ride to space station. It's been held on by Tether since EVA-1. Together they move it down to the nadir side of node two, where you can see that flashing ring. They'll install four fasteners to hold it in place and then attach two connectors that were previously loosened in the payload bay. This later allows the SSRMS to be based on this grapple fixture for future robotics operations. <laughs>